That was a karakia to help open what we call the Fatu Manawa or the third eye. That allows us to have a broader vision and to open ourselves to the truth. I'll just pass it over to you. Yeah. Hey, hey. Kia ora everybody and thank you all so much for coming today and thank you for welcoming us. Thank you, it's hugely appreciated.
So um, we worked out a plan of five grocery shopping and we made these 5G not in my bubbles, well I made that sign and different people made different signs and we turned up at one, conveniently turned up at one supermarket at noon on the Saturday with our signs. We actually got trespassed off that, that supermarket because they were really nervous having this bunch of Nelson residents um, turning up with protest signs during lockdown, it was quite bizarre. So anyway, that gave us a good excuse to walk down the road to another supermarket and um, do the same thing at that supermarket. And when we couldn't buy basic ingredients that we needed like flour and yeast and things like that, we had to walk down the road to another supermarket. So we ended up being able to walk all around Nelson with our protest signs. And um, the first week it was really scary. It was like everybody was just in shock. And people that would normally be our friends wouldn't talk to us and they would walk, avoid us and walk around the street to avoid having to have a connection with somebody. So anyway, we decided we'd carry on and the next week we went back and went by grocery shopping again, conveniently at noon, in the same sort of general route. And we've done that ever since right the way through lockdown. Um, and, but it was a, still a bit clear that there were quite a few people that were concerned about the loss of democracy and the loss of freedoms, but a lot of other people seemed to be afraid to even think about it. So we tried to work out a way where we could actually engage everybody because this whole divide and conquer us and them is not the way forward for New Zealand. We've all got to be in this together. We've all got to be united and find common ground and feel able to speak out about what's important to us. But we can't be afraid to share our views because if we all sit there stressed and feeling unable to com communicate our views with our friends and family and neighbours and workmates and everything else, we've really actually lost our freedom of speech before we've even started. So we came up with this idea of what's your line? And it's this game we do with walk, talk and chalk where we, everybody's... Everybody's got a line at which they believe the government has over interfered in their lives and for many of us that line has been crossed already and for other people we may not have reached their line yet but they need to start thinking about it because if they want to have any rights and freedoms in their lives they need to have a plan about what they can do to protect those rights and freedoms because if we don't exercise our rights and freedoms they get lost, they just disappear. So what's our line? The idea of that is to get people to share their views. Are you happy about the idea of mandatory vaccination? No. Are you happy about the idea that your child could go to school and be given a mandatory vaccination without you even knowing? Are you happy that the police can come into your home without your consent and without a warrant? No. Hell no. And that line is a really scary line because that wasn't even a line. The first week we did What's Your Line, it wasn't even a line that we thought about. But that came during this COVID Response Health Act that was passed by Parliament basically in 24 hours. Um, I posted up because I saw a list of what Parliament was considering that week. And people posted and said, no, 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 that can't be right. Parliament doesn't work like that. Parliament has a process where people are consulted, select committee hearings, all sorts of ways and means that the public have their say. Well, within 24 hours, that law had passed. And, and it says that police officers, if they've got reasonable grounds to believe that you may be having too many people in your home, like more than the magical number 10, um, or if they believe that you may have illness in your home, they can come into your home without a warrant and they can um, give you fines, they can do all sorts of different things, they can force you to be tested for medical procedures. doesn't say vaccinate, but it, they can test you. Mm. So that line wasn't even on the agenda the first week that we did What's Your Line? And during that week, within a few days, all of a sudden, there was this whole new line that was extremely concerning to many people. There's also, um, what's your line? Are you happy for people who aren't trained police officers to be given all of these powers to stop you and ask you questions and, and require um, testing to be done? I'm not, and I'm sure many other people aren't. 
Um, there are all sorts of issues that we've had for a long time with the poisoning of our land in Tianadi, and we've got the magnificent Trisha and um, Lynn and team of Theory raising awareness about this. Trisha over there and Lynn over there, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you say, but another amazing Theory here, um, raising awareness about poisoning of our land because you don't hear so much about it in the city although we did hear about it in Auckland because we were here from court case a few years ago where the government wanted to poison the Auckland drinking water now all around the world 1080 poison is treated as a potential terrorist weapon because terrorists might put it in community drinking water well what happened in Auckland was the Auckland City Council and the government through the Department of Conservation decided that it would be a good idea to intentionally poison Auckland's main drinking water in the mm. Hanuas because there may be some rodents and possums that may interfere with their kokako breeding program. Now all of us love native birds but I really have to question how far you would go to protect a native bird that's been deliberately put in an area when you're also intentionally threatening or poisoning a public drinking water of a city of a million people with a poison that all around the world is treated as a terrorist weapon if it gets into drinking water. So these are the type of things that have been happening and we haven't been asked. And in fact, not only have we not been asked, but we used to have rights rights through processes like the resource management process where we would automatically be asked and those rights have serially been taken away so the um the poisoning because the public were causing far too much trouble by opposing poison being put in drinking water and in food chains so the government through nick smith when he was minister for the environment intentionally removed the right for people to have a say and be consulted on the aerial spread and other use of 1080 poison and Bridificum poison. We've been going through the same type of issue with 5G radiation and 5G cell towers. So way back in 2008, the, um, I was asked to get involved at the Atapai Place Centre. Telecom wanted to put a cell tower five metres from our sand pit and, and the place centre. And most of the community thought that wasn't a very good idea. And in 2008, we actually could go and make, um, go through the resource consent process and object to it. And we had some rights in those days. What's happened since then is the law has changed and all um, cell towers and radiation are assumed to be safe. And that's despite the World Health Organization classifying it as a class 2B possible carcinogen. So as the World Health Organization has got more concerned about the risks from radiation, the government has decided, that, well, let's just assume it's safe and there's no process for the public to be able to oppose it. Yeah. <laughs> so, with, um, five, so with the 5G issue, the New Zealand Outdoors Party made a formal complaint to the government, the Regulations Review Committee, about these regulations that exempt 5G from all of the usual resource management processes. We made that complaint back in January, and it was supposed to be heard in April, which would have been at least reasonably timely. However, because of COVID and the lockdown, Parliament decided that it wasn't dealing with any of the matters raised by the public and it wasn't having any public hearings about pretty much anything. Um, so our hearing was postponed and we've just learned that it's, we've now got a hearing on the 17th of June. They've told us that we can only appear by Zoom because Parliament is still in partial lockdown. I'm going to go to Parliament and I'm going to sit out on their front lawn and Zoom from there. <laughs> Because if we don't, again, stand up for our rights and argue about what's okay and what's not okay, it's not up to them. What, what's happened is our parliament has got very complacent and they've forgotten that they're elected to represent the people. And they start, are they, they're starting to think that it's all their, their set up and it's all for them. Well, no, we've got an election coming in three months. And that is our one chance every three years to remind them that they're there to represent us and to ask very hard questions leading up to the election to ask, 
what are you going to do about all these different issues? Because we are not happy about being excluded from decisions. So I'm often asked what we can do um, about the things that we're not happy about. And it's actually really difficult because it's a bit like a big funnel. All of the, all of the um, decision making kind of gets into this big funnel and it's directed in a certain direction. And it's not the direction that the public wanted to be directed into. It's the direction that our represented officials choose to direct it down. And it makes it very, very difficult to get involved because the further down the funnel it goes, the less options we have to redirect things the way we want them to go instead of the way they want them to go. So we have to get quite creative to get a, get a chance to redirect things. One of the things we can do is exactly what we're doing today, and I congratulate everybody on being here today because the more we get information and the more we share ideas and the more we even think about what is our view on on these different issues because if we don't if we don't communicate these ideas and share these ideas we're, we're very lone voices and you feel a bit isolated but when we all get together and we share ideas and we find our sort of tribe where we got like-minded people around us it gives us courage to speak out a little bit louder than we would otherwise speak out so this idea of Encouraging people to speak or to write on with chalk what their views are is, is one really good way to get people thinking and sharing ideas. And our chalk lasts for a, you know, a few hours at least and maybe a bit longer if it doesn't rain. So people walking past go, what's all this about? Gosh, I didn't know about that. And it gets people thinking. So getting people thinking is a really, really good start. Another thing we can do is try our best to hold our elected representatives to account. So they're trying to do everything they can do to do what they want without being held to account. But we still do have things that we can do to hold them to account. And I've been asked particularly today to talk about this, so I'll, do, I'll, I'll give you a few ideas. We do have in New Zealand what's called the Official Information Act. And the starting point is that all the information that our government has got is our information. And they hold it for us on our behalf. And if we ask for that information, they have to give it to us. So they often forget that it's our information, but the fact is the law is very clear, it's our information. And if we ask for information, most types of information must be given to us within 20 working days, unless they've got a very good reason why not. So you can ask any government official, any minister of the Crown, and there's a similar law for local councils and local bodies, which is called the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act, you can ask any of them for any information you want about any issue that you want. And you don't have to tell them why you want the information, you just ask for what you want. And if you ask in a way that's not very clear, they have to come back and ask for clarification. But it's not, it, their obligation is to help you. And it doesn't matter what format you ask in, there's no particular forms you have to fill in. They try and get you to fill in their forms sometimes, but actually no, you can fill it, you can ask in any way you want. So. You can ask just by finding the email, so the government, it's always jacinda.ardern at parliament.gov.nz. That's the same formula for all of the politicians, their first name, dot, their second name, at parliament.gov.nz. And you can ask them for what you want. If you've asked the wrong person and they think that somebody else is better able to answer, it's their job to pass it to the right person and to tell you what they've done. So if everybody goes away and asks them, about, hang on, what happened to democracy? What was the justification for what you've done here? That is a very, very good way of starting to hold them to account. And it's actually quite annoying for them, because just imagine being the person sitting at the other end that's getting this big rush of requests asking for information. And for once, it's one thing that we can do that gives us some power back the other way. And we get information that's really useful, because once we get the information, we can then use the information and put it together. So you can ask through an email or you can write it, it's a bit slow these days. But there's also a really good website, fyi.org.nz. And that website gives you, you just choose who the question's for and you type in your questions and it automatically sends it away to the right person and it gives you an acknowledgement that it's done. So that's another really simple way to ask for official information. And I strongly encourage you to do that because 
without information is really difficult and they tend to take as long as they can to give it to you, even though it's supposed to be as soon as reasonably practicable, they tend to drag it out to the full 20 working days. But if you ask now, you get something useful that you can use. The, the next thing you can do is the Ombudsman. So there's a thing called the Ombudsman in New Zealand, which is, um, they're paid for by Parliament to try to hold um, government officials to account. And the Ombudsman's job is to look into any sort of misconduct by the government. If they breach the Official Information Act and they withhold information, you can get information through the Ombudsman. Most people don't even know that the Ombudsman exists, but they've got a website on, on the internet that you can find and you can ask them for information. It's really useful to know that they're there. The third one is the Auditor General. They've also another organisation um, that are paid for by us and their job is to hold government to account and investigate um, wrongful government conduct and, and um, the failure to, or the misapplication of government money, that type of thing. It's really useful to know that they're there as well. The best thing though we can do, the most immediate thing is the election in three months. And we've got a huge amount of opportunity to hold our government to account during the election process, going to meetings and asking them questions and asking them what their plans are and what they intend to do next and what their policies are on different issues and finding which political parties agree with your views and which political parties are willing to put the public before overseas agendas. Because if we don't choose elected representatives who represent us, we can't really blame us you know, we can't really complain if we then get politicians who don't represent us. So we need to ask really hard questions about what their agendas are. So I, my background is as a lawyer, but I've got into politics because I got frustrated with the legal system. There's only so much you can do with the law. There's a lot more you can do, a lot more effectively to bring about change for people power, which is my kind of thing that I believe in. Um, through the political system and by working together to to find out what political parties stand for and what their views are and what they will commit to in the future. Um, so I've, I'm the co-leader of the New Zealand Outdoors Party because the Outdoors Party is the party that is trying to turn all of these things around to give power back to the people. And what many people don't know in New Zealand is that we don't have a proper constitution, which means that our elected representatives can basically do anything they like with a 51% vote. None of our laws are, are, have got constraints on them. None of our rights and freedoms are protected under our current system. Every single one of what we think are our rights and freedoms can be removed by a 51% vote. And many of them can be removed by regulations which don't even need a 51% vote from Parliament if they, can, they use the umbrella of a law that's already been passed to create regulations. So, for example, with this COVID law that's just gone through, um, an, an act was passed which gave the government powers to do certain things, to lock us down and whatever, and then they just have to pass what's called an order. So the Prime Minister or the Minister of Health can pass an order and under that order they can impose a whole lot of restrictions on us without even going through a parliamentary process. It's pretty scary stuff. Um, we do have a thing, well we have the Treaty of Waitangi, we have the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act and we have some very old documents, the Magna Carta and the old Bill of Rights from um, 1688 I think it is. And they all write down what we used to think were fundamental rights but what we've learned is those rights are all subject to the whim of Parliament. So, what... So, I'll oh, just keep, keep talking, but we've got a better megaphone coming, which is awesome. One, two, one, two. Yeah. Test one, two, one, two.
get arrested for taking the paddleboard for a walk. And when I actually read the law, I realised that they actually couldn't stop us doing outdoor activities at all, except where there was a congregation of people. And that made a little bit more sense. You know, if there genuinely was a virus that, that genuinely was spreading, yes, maybe stop people congregating outdoors, but why would you stop people doing individual activities outdoors when we all know that vitamin D is good for us and it's good for our mental health to get out and about and do all these things. So that, that was one thing that made me really suspicious about what was going on and that encouraged me to really start looking at these laws. Because those laws that they told us were rules that we couldn't do things were never the law. And I wrote to the Prime Minister, I wrote to the Attorney General and I wrote to the Nelson Police and I said, hey, you can't under the law stop us from engaging in solitary outdoor activities like paddle boarding and kayaking and fishing and all these things. And if you think I'm wrong, tell me where in the law you're relying and why I'm wrong. Well, they never answered me. So after that, I actually went paddle boarding properly, not taking my paddle board for a walk. I took a whole bag, a plastic bag full of law with me just in case anybody dobbed me in and the police came and challenged me, but as it happened they didn't and um, that, I mean that was just the beginning of me being really suspicious about what was going on and saying why is all this happening and you know it's the sort of start of this massive concept conversation where we're getting more and more people's views on what's going on. So all I'm going to say is we need a vision of what we do want because if we don't have a vision of what we do want we keep losing things you know and we shouldn't have to stand up and say ban 1080 and do this and do that we should actually have a vision of a thriving magnificent New Zealand Aotearoa where we all get on with each other we respect each other we've all got hope for the future we don't have all these horrible mental health problems we don't have all this bullying that's going on we don't have the government telling us lies you know we we've, we've, we've got to have a vision of what we do want and somehow we've got to have this conversation to build back in the views of the people because everything's been done to exclude us we've got to turn the whole thing back to front and find ways of building back in what we do want and then taking the steps that we need to do it. So everybody's, sometimes adversity brings out the best. You know, we've maybe had it too good and we all got a bit lazy and a bit complacent, but now we realize how fragile our democracy is. And now we're starting to stand and we're starting to talk to each other and starting to work out ways to, to win our democracy back. And it's so important that we do that. Now, while we're doing that, let's take it as far as we can. Let's create this vision. Let's take back New Zealand for the, the freedom of New Zealand, the freedom of New Zealanders. Let's take back what's special about New Zealand. Let's not get bullied into other agendas that don't suit us. Let's do what's good for us. It's okay to do what's good for us. You know, we yeah. shouldn't feel bad about what's doing good for us as a country. So I don't know, there's so much I can talk about, but I'm going to see if anyone else wants to have a chat now. Sure.
I came from Papa Tai Tai today. Many people in South Auckland are also waking up to the racism of the government. They don't want to be treated special. They want to be treated like an, an individual, equal to everyone. And it's insulting to them. And I, I ask many of them who are speaking about these issues, I say, do you watch the news? And they say, nothing good will come from the news. So it's a waste of our time to watch the news. Exactly. It's all corrupt. Exactly. They are calling people with uh, different opinions hate speech, while the news incite hate. They incite hate against Donald Trump supporters so much so that last when was that BLM march here? June, or was it uh, June 1st Monday? There were two men over there. They obviously weren't white supremacists because they were brown men. If they were... No, 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 hold on, hold on. There were two men standing there with MAGA hats. All they did was want to speak to their countrymen, to speak as human beings. But what happened? Because they wore a hat, they were attacked, they were assaulted. Why? Because people have made this hatred up. And for what reason? The people who hated them and who were harassing them and who stole and burned their hat, they could not give a reasonable reason. They could. And this man, one of these men, I've heard they've lost their jobs. What the hell is going on when someone can wear a hat, lose their job after being assaulted? And I did not hear one word from the media about that case of violence on Monday. I was there. I was down the street. I did not see that. If I did, I would have tried to protect those men because they did nothing wrong. All they did was stick up for their freedom of speech and to try bridge a political division gap, which is making people violent, which is making people filled with hatred. So I ask you, New Zealand, who are the real hate speakers? Who are the people who are lying to us, making us hate each other? Thank you. What's happened to my battery? Oh, what's your head? Usually no, no. <laughs> speaking into the right side for once, dumbass. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, point too close to no, each no, no, other, that's, that's the thing. Uh, so, so uh, I'm Vinnie Eastwood from the Vinnie Eastwood Show. Just a quick survey. How many of you uh, hate me and want to kill me? Uh, just, just <laughs> show ahead. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I talk about uh, conspiracies and uh, basically anything the mainstream media doesn't talk about, any question the uh, politicians don't answer, which means I have to cover everything and answer all the questions. So uh, that's why I've got more subscribers than News Hub, New Zealand Herald TV. Yeah. Yes. TVNZ uh, and all of these other organizations that have been around for, in some cases, the uh, case of the New Zealand Herald, 180 years. The reason I've got, probably got more subscribers to them is because I've uh, had a look at uh, protests when I got, went out, and all these people that pick up the megaphone, the news would give them maybe 30 seconds, if that, if anything. And then I would go and talk to these people for two hours and learn a hell of a lot. Mostly what I learned is that these people are actually interested in something. They actually show true care. Unlike journalists, unlike reporters, unlike politicians, unlike judges, these people show true care for their fellow man and they are willing to sacrifice their time, their liberty, and in some cases their lives to ensure that their fellow man is heard, respected, and not forgotten. I do that and interview these people, currently 4,000 videos, averaging in length between one and the longest show I've ever done was six hours. Let's think about this, ladies and gentlemen. How much of you here have a cell phone that you're recording something with? Just raise your hands if you're recording something right now. One, two, maybe half a dozen of you. Okay. How many of you are actually planning to take the time to edit that video before you upload it. 
okay? How many of you are willing to upload it just in general? That's the thing. You've got to do this. You have to film it, get it uploaded. The best trick here is live streaming. You know how long it takes to edit a six hour show when you're live streaming? Six hours, including doing the show. <laughs> All right? So I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, the amount of people watching on here right now is about equal to this crowd here. So just me by myself live streaming from a phone at virtually no cost has doubled the size of the viewing audience of the protest. Now, yeah. with that, Take a lesson from it, and this isn't about me, this is about everybody using the technology that we have available to amplify the voices of the speakers, okay? I, I got a call before coming in today from a uh, Veterans Affairs uh, uh, person who deals with a lot of people from World War I, who had their land stolen from the government while they were away fighting, and their families are still fighting to get their lands back. And I said to him after he'd uh, basically ranted at me about, about his cause for about 15 minutes while I had my pants off trying to get to this protest here. Um, I said to him, look, you don't need me to tell you what to do. All you need is a platform to stand on and an amplification device. I'm going to provide that for you. And that's what I'm providing here. And I encourage everybody to serve your fellow man by simply amplifying their voices. Learn how to live stream. It takes five to ten minutes. And these voices get recorded basically forever. Until, of course, the YouTube takes them down. Uh, but but uh, just remember that when they're live streamed, those videos still are available well after the live stream. That kind of thing. So record the voices of your people who are telling the truth. Amplify them. And you will make a difference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian Herald, because they're not New Zealand Herald. Um, they had a poll. First time I saw it, 80% of New Zealanders said we wouldn't take the COVID-19 vaccine when it comes out. Next time I saw it, it was 47% said they wouldn't take the vaccine. So then they took the poll down. That was it. No one else was allowed to vote because they, what they saw was things weren't going the way they wanted it to go. So people, let's say 50% of New Zealanders would say no. We're already, we're already there. We've already turned the corner. People get it. They're not stupid and blind. So we're just the starting point. We're the spearhead of that. So keep talking, keep sharing your truth. Don't be afraid. Kia ora, Koto. And for me, I will not travel if they say uh, an immunisation passport or no travel. I won't take that vaccine. It will be too dangerous to my health. Yeah. The guy from uh, Allensley. Uh, I'm, okay, I'm a guy from Allensley. I'm Ken, and I've been studying this thing. I've been studying this thing for quite a while now and a lot of this stuff about this COVID-19 it's actually so much crap overseas that are actually they pay them $13,000 to say they've got COVID-19 if they die of COVID-19 and the doctor writes it on the certificate even if the shark bit your ass and you bled to death you're still dying of COVID-19 well they get 39 thousand dollars and this wearing face masks is a whole lot of that makes you really sick you can't be wearing face masks everywhere they're only made for doctors that don't slobber and dribble when they're operating on you because what it does when you wear a face mask is it actually puts your body into a folk, a false sense of it can't breathe and it, and, it, uh, and it causes you to have heart attacks and all sorts of problems and if you've noticed, if you put one on and you walk around, you have to find a job breathing. I'm actually finding a job breathing now because I have a breathing problem. But, uh, <laughs> and um, also the governments over in America with this George Floyd thing, that's all bullshit. I mean, the guy that's on the ground getting his head squashed into the footpath is a Freemason. The guy on his, pushing his head into the ground is a Freemason. And the government, the governor of the city is a Freemason, and, they're pay, and they are paid by George Soros. They got paid three million dollars for that. Anyway, thanks. <laughs>
Okay, kia ora whanau. Um, awesome to be here. I just wanted to say that, uh, so true, united we stand, divided we fall. We've got a lot of us, I'm very outspoken on uh, vaccines. I know somebody whose child's died. I know too many people and heard of too many people whose children are injured and they get treated like complete crap. But we have here groups for 5G or people who support 5G or are, sorry, are opposed to 5G, are opposed to uh, 1080. My girlfriend over there and I went up to a wonderful uh, opposition to 5G doco and lots of good people in Tirurangi. But we need to come together. We need to, in our groups, where we've got thousands and thousands of members, we need to get our admins, start sending out messages private messages so that all the watchers are not, uh, get the message. We need to start plastering things in our schools, in car parks, in the supermarkets. We need to get the message out mainstream peeps because we're in deep crap, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Now also I'd like to raise uh, this whole load of bollocks about uh, how we're going to the supermarkets and nobody's doing contact tracing in the shops. Why are we still having to contact trace at government departments and at schools? And I think it's because down the track, no vaccine, no library for you, no vaccine, no school for you. We need to start pushing back to these councils, pushing back to these schools and saying, why? Why? No, I'm not. We can be pleasant and polite, say, no, I'm not using a hand sanitizer. No, my child is not using hand sanitizer 10 times a day at school. And why can I not walk my child, my five-year-old child to class? There's like fucking 50 people. Sorry, I'm really, I'm, I'm tired. And there's like, we've got like 80 parents all crowded around outside our school gate at three o'clock social distancing my ass. I mean, yes. for goodness sake, we could be spread across the whole the whole courts, you know, and we're not asking the questions and we're not pushing back and we're towing the line. So we need to start pushing back. We need to start putting these little flyer things in all the cars and the supermarkets. Yes. And I just, more power to you people because I'm worried, eh? Yeah. Really worried. And I, I, my kids are not vaccine injured because somebody was good enough to come and tell me. But there are thousands out there that are. That, that are. And this is actually our opportunity, instead of saying no to 1018, no to 5G, no to New World Order, no to vaccines, yes to freedom, our chance to wake up mega, mega people. Yes. Anyway, yeah. I'm